Hey, so remember how in the last video I said that I was going to be reworking the iceberg to add like more interesting things and stuff that I just think would work for the series and how I said it was going to be about the same size? Well, I had one of my moments and decided to just keep adding more and more stuff and then the iceberg that was previously like 80 to 100 terms now looks like this. So. I don't think we're finishing this in December, at least not this December. I have compiled an iceberg of 350 different cryptids. Now, I don't think I got every cryptid in the world, but I do think I at least got nearly every type of cryptid in the world. For example, nearly every culture has some kind of werewolf figure or some kind of Bigfoot figure, so maybe I didn't get every specific one, but I got all the big ones. So hopefully this massive list can satisfy whatever I'm trying to prove to myself. A link to the iceberg image will be in the description. And when I posted this on Twitter, some people were confused as to why it seemed that some things near the bottom of the iceberg were more well known than stuff around the middle. And the reason for that is I didn't entirely structure this iceberg off of known to unknown because then like the bottom three tiers would be just a bunch of really obscure dog looking things that were reported in the jungle one time and I don't really think that would make for an interesting finale to the series so instead I have ranked this iceberg by vibes like with the beginning we're still sticking with the well-known stuff but as the iceberg goes down it gets to a lot more of the obscure and strange especially around the middle but then at the bottom it gets to the ethereal or the spectral like sure the iceberg still starts with a lot of the well-known famous cryptids but then as you go down it starts to get to more of the unknown cryptids and then at the bottom it starts to get to the more obscure or paranormal or almost ethereal cryptids that's because I wanted to rank this iceberg by more so the enjoyment factor that you all should get throughout the series. For now, we continue to talk about the creepy and the monstrous, and then we get into more implications, things that maybe didn't go extinct, or things that restructure how we look at the biological tree. And then by the bottom of it, we get into things related to ghostly sightings, or things that shouldn't exist, or warp our understanding of reality. At the end of the day, I'm trying to entertain you all, so I have structured this iceberg off what I believe to be the most entertaining way to do this. And I'll be completely honest, there were a lot of terms that didn't really fit in anywhere, so I just used a random number generator and assigned them to one of the 18 tiers. Again, we've already covered the first two tiers of this iceberg in parts one and two of this series, and I apparently wasn't miserable enough, so we'll see how it goes from here. I'm also going to leave links in the description to a lot of the websites that I pulled these names from. Websites like the Cryptozoology Files or the Cryptid Wiki go a long way into giving me a bunch of names of things I've otherwise never heard of. To be honest, I have no idea why I did this to myself. I, when I began the series, thought that 100 terms may be a bit much, and then I'm like, okay, I'll do it for myself and make it 350. Uh, it probably speaks to some greater level of imposter syndrome or self-deprecation that I have or other things that I don't have time to think about. But what I do have time to think about is creepy monsters. Since we're getting into a list of things that are weird and unsettling and frankly long, and this series will almost certainly be something that leads to another one of my episodes, let's tread into these dark waters with a friend by our side. And that friend is today's sponsor who we've all come to know and love AG1. AG1 being our one and only comprehensive foundational nutritional supplement. At this point, I should be able to just say the words or letters and a number, AG1, and you all should just head to the link in the description and figure it out for yourselves. But I'm going to go ahead and explain it anyway, because some of you aren't as ride or die as you claim to be. A lot of you all aren't eating the nutritional meals that you should be for every meal. And as someone as chronically online as I am, I get it. But just because you have been unhealthy doesn't mean you should continue to be. And you can get on the right track today with AG1. That's because AG1 contains things like your daily dose of pre and probiotics, immune support supplements, nutritional supplements, multivitamins, and multiminerals. And instead of being a bunch of pills and herbs that you have to take every day is instead just one drink. And that one drink supports everything from your brain to your gut to your whole body in one easy step. And by easy, 
I mean easy. Because all you need is a spoonful of AG1, 12 ounces of water, and you're good to go. AG1 is simple and effective, and that's why it's the nutritional brand that's been leading the pack since 2010. AG1 is incredibly easy to keep track of because, again, it's just one drink, it's easy to make, but the effects of it, at least for me, were very plain to see because as someone who wasn't getting the nutrition he needed every day, after drinking this, I had more energy to get work done, I had more energy for social events, to go to the gym, and it's not like the drink is some miracle tonic that immediately fixed all my problems, but it gave me the energy to start fixing them for myself. And to top all of that off, if you're hearing everything that I'm saying and think to yourself, well, that sounds good, but I really don't want to drink whatever that green sludge is. The cool thing about AG1 is that it tastes just fine. It's just a naturally sweet kind of tea flavor that I enjoy as a part of my morning routine. AG1 is, and yes, it's almost empty because I forgot that I needed it for the rest of this ad and drank most of it, but just ignore that part. AG1 is the drink that can help you take care of your body the way that you deserve. And right now, there's never been a better time to get in on the action. That's because right now, if you head to the link in the description at drinkag1.com forward slash windagoon, along with your AG1, you'll receive these two free gifts. The first gift is five extra days worth of AG1 in their convenient travel packs, which means even more AG1 and AG1 on the go. So what's not to love? And the other is a year's supply of vitamin D3 and K2. Just put this in a drop of your coffee or AG1 in the morning to get even more of the nutrition that you need. So once again, to get these two free gifts, just head to the link in the description at drinkag1.com slash windagoon to be able to receive this along with your AG1 and get in on this fantastic offer today. Thank you all so much for watching the ad. Thank you so much to AG1 for sponsoring this video. It really does mean the most. Hope you all check them out. Link is in the description and we are back to the video. We are gonna go ahead and get into it, but as always, thank you for watching. I'm also realizing looking at this that I'm gonna to have to make the names a lot smaller to fit 350 terms up there, but um, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. With all of that out of the way, we are now on to tier three beginning with the Kelly Hopskinville Goblins. On August the 24th, 1955, Christian County, Kentucky became the site of a new addition to America's Boogeymen. That night, 12 members of the Sutton household arrived at the local police station, claiming to have held off over a dozen small creatures with gunfire for the past four hours. 16 officers from several departments investigated the Sutton household and determined that, while no creatures were found, a shootout took place from within the home. Late that night, the family left town after telling neighbors that they had seen the creatures again. In the years since, the legend has grown into that of three feet tall, beady-eyed, green aliens who are residents of the Kentucky woods and attack any who happen upon the Kelly Hopskinville area. The goblins are fun creatures. I was born in Kentucky and a lot of my family had stories about being out in the woods late at night and running into these like little gremlin things peering out from behind a tree. And I also just really love whenever a cryptid has like an origin moment, like there's one specific event, like with things like the Jersey Devil or the Flatwoods Monster that caused the legend to birth from a starting point both because I think it's more interesting narratively, and also if one of these creatures was to be real, then there probably would be a single sighting that changed cultures and mindsets in the region. It's cool, it's creepy, and it's a classic, so I'm calling it A-tier. After that, we have the giant rabbit. Tales of giant rabbits, or hares, have existed across the world's cultures for centuries. Notable among these legends is that of Australian prospectors who, in the 1800s, claimed to see rabbits 9 feet long and 12 feet tall. Other sightings, like the 5 foot tall Tit Canyon rabbit spotted in 1969 near Los Angeles, add to the sum of legendary bunnies across the globe. These diverse and reoccurring appearances implies that a rare, undocumented species of hare may exist just beyond our understanding. You'll hear giant rabbits mentioned in a lot of tall tales or legends from the American West, stories of a group of settlers being attacked by an entire nest of giant rabbits, or you'll hear stuff from the Australian continent of people who uh, see giant rabbits like destroy their crops or attack their wildlife. I do want to mention though, that I think the note of giant rabbits inside of the Australian interior is really stupid because do you know what prospectors in the 1800s were probably seeing? 
Duh. But that being said, giant rabbits appear in a lot of different cultures and can sometimes be used for comedic or interesting effect. Which barely makes it get into D tier for me because otherwise it's just a big rabbit. Up next we have a term that isn't a cryptid but something I want to talk about. BB. And that is the 1934 BB dive sightings. Basically, from 1930 to 1934, a biologist named William Beebe and a bathysphere designer named Otis Barton became the first people to observe deep sea creatures in their natural habitat. They did this by hooking a bathysphere up to the side of a boat, descending to great depths, and in addition to breaking several diving records during their excursions, they also discovered several new species of fish. Through the small 8-inch portholes in the bathysphere, Beebe described creatures that he called the giant dragonfish, the pallid sailfin, the five-star constellation fish, and many more. It's interesting that such a short glimpse into underwater life can yield so many new discoveries. But perhaps the most terrifying part of the discovery is that these fish that Beebe found have never definitively been seen again. There's a lot of theories that maybe the constellation fish was what we know now to be a type of jellyfish or that maybe the dragonfish was in actuality an oarfish. The reason I wanted to bring it up as a non-applicable, even though it's not really a cryptid, is because it serves as a testament to how mysterious the ocean can be. It seems that every time we go down there, we discover something new, and it serves as a grim reminder that we shared this planet with something that is almost entirely unknown. After that, we have Pepe. Pepe is the monster of the Mississippi River. Named after Lake Pepin of the Minnesota-Wisconsin border, Pepe is said to stalk the whole of the river with popular sightings of him occurring in and around Iowa. What makes Pepe intriguing amongst the competition of sea serpents in inland bodies of water is that native people along the massive Mississippi River all held legends of a beast beneath the water despite never encountering one another, implying that sightings of Pepe could extend beyond cultures and traditions. This, in combination with sightings of massive serpents spotted near Lake Pepin, dating back to newspaper reports from the 1870s, further support the legend. In 2008, a $50,000 bounty was placed for definitive evidence of the creature, a reward that is to this day unclaimed. Pepe's cool and all, you know, another Loch Ness monster type creature inside of an inland body of water. Never seen one of those before. And yeah, the Mississippi has a lot of legends and lore behind it, so I get it, but we all know how I feel about really big fish. It's a D tier for me. You know, honestly, I don't even have a problem with big fish. As a matter of fact, like lakes having legends of giant bass or bluegill or whatever, or one we're actually gonna look at in a second, those are cooler to me than just taking the Loch Ness Monster and putting it in a different lake. It's just so reductive. These are gonna get moved down to F tier if I keep thinking about it, we'll move on. And now, you all get to hear more of my horrific mispronunciations because up next we have the Mukade Kujira. Japanese for whale centipede, this creature was first reported in 1709 and is described as the size of a whale having five fins, a mane, red skin, and is highly poisonous. While this specific sighting is often relegated to legend in Japanese culture, it does coincide with other sea centipede sightings across the world. These many finned creatures could be some undocumented species of arthropod or a great species of ancient sea monster. See, here we're getting some uniqueness, something interesting. It's as big as a whale, but it's a whale centipede because it has all these different fins and it's got a lion's mane. That's neat. I like that. It's not like there's a ton more to it. I'm going to put it at C tier, but it's not just copy pasting the Loch Ness Monster into whatever you want your tourist destination to be. That was a bit harsh. I don't know why I'm so mad at like Champy and the Ogopogo, um, but I'll, I'll address that part of myself later. Now we have the legend of the skinwalker. The Navajo have a legend of an accursed being that can mimic the appearance and voices of their victims. Witches, those who practice sinister magic composed of malice and death, can give themselves to their practice and become a beast capable of stealing the skin of others. In some variations, the skinwalker is able to take the form of those they kill and in others, mimics animals of trickery such as a coyote. The Skinwalker serves as an antagonist to many Navajo legends, yet stories of animals, 
and even people, seen behaving strangely in the American West lead many to believe that this myth isn't a myth after all. There's a lot of like misinformation around the Skinwalker. A lot of people just think it's a Wendigo out West, but the legends are very different. Legends of Skinwalkers come from stories of people who practice taboo arts and medicine and eventually turned themselves into a spirit of trickery, a mimic of evil. I'm sure that we've all probably heard stories or seen videos of animals acting strange or of a call in the night that doesn't sound quite right. And the Skinwalker places itself perfectly in the uncanny valley of our knowledge of nature. It's really cool and really scary, so I'm calling it A tier. After that, we have the Malagillage, AKA the Tailed Men, these creatures were first spotted in the southern region of Chad in the early 1800s. They are described as having reddish skin, tails, a humanoid face, and long hair. Reportedly, these beings even managed livestock in the form of black camels. According to legend, the king of Kurdi Sara once gave a Malagillage to the Sultan of Bakmimi. I am so sorry for mispronouncing everything I just said. Many believe these stories to be of an undocumented or missing link humanoid that, if discovered, could reshape our understanding of humanity. There's several legends like this, especially in areas like Africa or South America that have these vastly uncharted regions of wildlife. There's always some kind of legend of either a really short humanoid group of people or a really tall humanoid group of people living in tribes in the middle of the wilderness. And the Malagillage is an interesting example of that. The note of them having tails is unique as well. There's been some historians who theorize maybe it was a group of shorter people who wore like animal pelts and from a distance it just looked like they had a tail. But then there's other legends of them being captured in cages and sent as like diplomatic gifts to other kingdoms. Even if it doesn't say a lot about biology, it does say a lot about cultures and storytelling. So I'm putting it at C tier. Next up, we've got the Lutoyu Lang. This cryptid hails from the rural plains of China and its name means donkey headed wolf. Its appearance is exactly that, a wolf with the head of a horse or donkey meaning the animal has the ability to both neigh and bark. Legends of a horse-like carnivore date back centuries, and as recently as the mid-1900s, many have reported seeing or even killing one of these creatures. This apex predator could be an either undiscovered or unnatural canine that has carefully avoided mankind while preying on it from the shadows. This one's pretty to the point. It's a wolf, and its head looks like a horse. That's weird. But people up until the last century have reported seeing them and even hunting them. So maybe this is a species of wolf that has gone extinct in recent history. And rather than being the head of a horse just transplanted onto a wolf, is instead a wolf that had an oddly shaped head. Because if you've seen some pictures of how animals look around Tibet, especially that weird fox thing, I can't think of its name right now, but I'll put a picture up. Sometimes animals can just look weird for some reason. I'm calling it D tier because it doesn't have a lot going for it, but it's always interesting to hear a story of a cryptid that could very plausibly be real. Next up, we've got the Wawasee Sturgeon. Lake Wawasee of Indiana is home to a tale of a giant fish. Sturgeons are known as one of the largest species of freshwater fish in North America, and although uncommon, historical records point to evidence of sturgeons being caught on rare occasions in the lake with the most recent report of a catch and release occurring in 1991. However, local legend says that at one point, the lake was teeming with the species before a single member grew to a size and appetite beyond the rest. Reports of a super sturgeon up to 20 feet long appear in local circuits on occasion. Given that known species of sturgeon can live in excess of 100 years, this mega variant could date true to the old legends it has become tied to. The rare case of people feeling a quick tug from beneath the water implies that a creature of voracious appetite may be testing the surface for new prey. Okay, so remember how earlier I said I don't like just taking the Loch Ness Monster and putting it into lakes? This one's different enough for me. I do love a good fisherman's tale, and the story of one fish that out ate the rest and became 
this gigantic record setting member of its species is pretty cool. Especially when there's like historical evidence to kind of drive the point home. Like sure, sturgeon were caught in pretty good amounts at one point in the lake, but they've quit for some reason. Maybe that reason is one of them got really big and started out eating the rest. Also, sturgeon have always just kind of freaked me out because they can get to massive sizes and just exist in freshwater lakes around northern parts of the United States. So as a kid, whenever I'd be swimming in a lake, I would have that knowledge in the back of my head that biologically, one of those things could be in the water. I was saying this to myself in East Tennessee, but it made sense to me. Sure, it's just big fish, but I like it more than a lot of these ripoffs, so I'm gonna put it at C tier. Next up, we've got a personal favorite of mine, the hodag. The lumberjacks of Rhinelander, Wisconsin told tale of a beast that roams the tree line. The legend gained fame in 1893 when lumbermen reported a series of altercations with the creature, culminating in a dynamite killing and photograph. Its appearance is described by explorerhinelander.com as, quote, the head of a frog, the grinning face of a giant elephant, thick, short legs set off by huge claws, the back of a dinosaur, and a long tail with spears at the end. The hodag also had green eyes, huge fangs, and two horns sprouting from its temples. This creature can reach lengths of up to seven feet and even breathe fire. Legend says that the hodag are born from the ashes of oxen, burnt in the woods after experiencing cruelty at their master's hand, and now, invigorated with hellfire and revenge, seek to harm those who find themselves alone in the woods of Wisconsin. I love the hodag so much, and for a few reasons. For one, I'm so tired of different regions just stealing Bigfoot or Nessie like we've talked about and just making that their cryptid. They need to be unique with it, and it is hard to get more unique than the hodag. A little gremlin, tiny dinosaur, bulldog looking thing that breathes fire and has got horns, that's cool, that's unique. And also the idea that the hodag is born like a phoenix from the ashes of oxen that were put through the ringer and abused before being killed and their bodies not even buried but burned in the forest. The hodag is also a part of this greater realm of cryptids I like a lot called the fearsome critters, which is basically stories like this that lumbermen would tell each other, or hunters or trappers would tell each other. Uh, it basically creatures that they need to be afraid of at camp at night or that have really interesting rules or appearances or behavior about them. Some of the most interesting ideas from American folklore come from these fearsome critters and the hodag's one of them. Because in a many a tale, you'll hear stories of lumbermen out in the woods being chased off by these fire-breathing dog things. Or in other stories, there's warnings to not go sleep in a cave because you may run into a hodag nest. It checks all the boxes for me. It's cool and scary. It's got a cool backstory. It's used in interesting ways. To be honest, I think it might be an S tier. Because like, sure, these are probably my three favorite cryptids, the ones that are already up there. But I don't just wanna have three S tier for the whole series. And the Hodag's personal favorite of mine. So yeah, yeah, it's gonna be an S tier. You know, after doing that, it doesn't seem right that the Hodag is above the Jersey Devil. All right, fine. Jersey Devil's an S tier as well. What's the point of having a whole tier up here if I don't use it, right? And looking at it, those are my five favorite cryptids that I've covered so far. Cool, I like it. Next up, we have the Siren. Cultures throughout our history hold legends of feminine figures that drag men to their death, but few are as prevalent as that of the Siren. Sirens date back to Greek mythology. The legends of creatures with the body of a bird and head of a woman that tear apart men without remorse. Similarly, ancient sailors told legend of a mermaid rendition of the beast. Passerbys were tempted to enter the water by beautiful women with sweet songs, only to then be dragged to the depths. Stories of the siren made their way into several Eastern Hemisphere cultures, such as that of the siren, and stories of mysterious women leading men to their grave continue around the world to this day. We're all probably familiar with the siren. I'm sure that all of us, when we were kids, heard how the mermaid story isn't just about, you know, like the Disney version and is actually about these women that kill people. 
It seems that the original, at least written versions of the siren were the bird figure, like the body of a bird and the head of a woman, which isn't as popular as the mermaid variant. But that bird figure did work its way into a lot of cultures. Like a lot of early Germanic beliefs involved the siren, uh, the spelling with the R-I-N, then the R-E-N. And that siren pops up in a lot of early European mythology. Uh, and then the mermaid rendition, of course, shows up in a ton of Greek myths. What's the most interesting thing about the siren to me is the idea that it's not different creatures that just do similar things and is instead the same race or group of creatures that just mold themselves to the environment. So for example, if this siren is looking to, let's say, lead away soldiers who are off to war, maybe it will appear as a bird creature in the mountains. Or instead, if it's looking to lure away sailors, it will appear as a mermaid in the water. So you can follow that train of thought and say maybe some modern legends of these ghostly hitchhikers appearing on the side of the road who were lure men off into these abandoned trails only to never be seen again might be the same beast. So sure, while they lose some points because they're more of a mythological being than cryptid, I do think it's interesting to tie in the siren mythos to a lot of modern cryptid or paranormal sightings. So I'll call it right in the middle of the road at C tier. There's debate on which version of the spelling is more correct, but I already misspelled Megalodon earlier in this series and have yet to change that, so we're just gonna leave it. And speaking of things that are mega, up next we have the Megaconda. The Amazon rainforest is home to the largest serpents in the world, but one may exist at lengths beyond the rest. While the largest documented species of snakes can get up to 33 feet long, rumors exist of a snake well over a hundred. This megaconda, or what is locally called the Matataro, or bull eater, has been sighted by the natives and explorers of the region for the past century. British explorers have claimed to kill snakes as long as 62 feet, and reports from the 1940s detail a creature of up to 131 feet in length. Local legend, as well as impossible six-foot-wide paths in the most remote regions of the Amazon, suggest that perhaps a legendary titan boa may exist in the Green Inferno. The Megaconda makes a lot of sense, right? Uh, there's these giant swaths of the Amazon that are completely undiscovered, or at least undocumented. Uh, and it's also a known fact that some of the largest species of boas spend a lot of their life underwater uh, and they hunt things from within the water. So when you combine those two things, that there's uncharted territory and the biggest ones that we know of live underwater, then it stands to reason that if there are some giant ones, maybe we just haven't seen them yet. That in combination with the locals saying that they easily get over 100 feet in length, as well as trampled paths through the jungle that are six feet wide, leading from one source of water to the other, that would take a lot of effort if someone was just doing it for a prank. Maybe there is some truth to this legend. And it also leans more into the horrifying idea of what might happen to some people who go missing in the forest. So sure, even though the cryptid is just Big Snake, I think it's creepy and kind of cool and leans into a lot of the already creepy things that we know about the region, so I'm gonna call it a B tier. With that, we are on to dwarves. Dwarves have found their way into a myriad of folklore. While their influence was apparent across European mythos, they are most often associated with Germanic and Norse mythology. Typically, Dwarves are described as a race of craftsmen with strong connections to mysticism and the spiritual. Common aspects across tales describe them as short humanoids who live within rocks and mountains, or more broadly, in cohabitation with nature. Some believe these legends to originate from a forgotten species of humanoid now extinct. However, with sightings of small people appearing then disappearing from various locations around the world, Perhaps the stories are based on something more than just fantasy. Dwarves, I'm sure we're all familiar with them, uh, and they definitely count more towards mythology. The reason I wanted to mention them isn't because I think they're necessarily that much of a cryptid. As a matter of fact, I'm going to put them at NA, I think. Because while they're not necessarily a cryptid, it is interesting how they've worked their way into the cultural mindset. But I more so just want them to be in your mind as we talk about stuff later in the iceberg. 
We've already talked about some, like the Mala Gillage, how there's this idea of these undocumented humanoids that are really short and really good with nature or in tune with nature that live out in the wilderness. And dwarves are an example of them at least making their way into the stories we tell across different cultures. So not really a cryptid, but something to keep in mind as we talk about more examples of creatures like that later on in the series. After that, we have the Gigantopithecus blackie. This extinct species of ape was similar to modern orangutans save for one aspect, its size. This mega primate, believed by science to have been extinct for at least half a million years, is estimated to have grown anywhere between 9 to 12 feet tall and weighed over 600 pounds. Giant ape sightings occur around the world to this day. However, the more interesting inference to be made regarding Gigantopithecus is the credibility it lends more popular cryptid sightings. The majority of fossils are found in South China, placing the creature's habitat in the midst of the Yeti legend. Furthermore, furthermore, legends of Bigfoot are given legitimacy by Gigantopithecus's existence because the argument is no longer a creature such as Sasquatch exists, but rather it may simply have lived longer than we currently believe. Now judging it solely as a cryptid because like, sure, there's all that stuff relating to Sasquatch, which is cool and all, but judging it just as a cryptid, just as a big orangutan that sometimes gets found, that's an F tier. Because all that it is is a big ape that did at one point exist, and people say maybe it did exist. And once again, similar to the thylakine, sure, maybe it does. I don't care. Big monkey. Not interested. But what's fascinating about it is since tall ape things did exist at one point, well, then maybe stuff like, you know, Bigfoot or the Yeti or whatnot is given more credence because of that. I mean, we see with things like the coelacanth that something can believe to have been extinct for millions of years and then just one day show up. While as a cryptid, I don't think it's that cool. I think it is cool what it does for other cryptids. But with that out of the way, let's move on to the man monkey. On January the 21st of 1879, in what is now the Shropshire Union Canal of Great Britain, a mysterious figure was seen. According to an eyewitness, a ghostly black figure appeared from a field before stealing a horse and riding off into the night. When the witness attempted to hit the figure with a whip, the whip passed through the figure entirely. As this case was investigated, locals confirmed this event to be no rare occurrence. In fact, this creature, known as the Man Monkey, was infamous for attacking travelers near the Staffordshire, Birmingham area, who found themselves alone at night. While this may sound spectral, in some renditions of the tale, such as that of Old Ned's Devil, one of these creatures was beat to death by a man the creature attacked, and then mounted in a local pub. The reoccurring sightings lead many to believe that, at least for a time, an ape-like wild man species plagued the roadsides of the UK. So the man monkey's cool and all. Uh, it is a monkey man thing that randomly attacks people who are out alone at night. Classic, you know, cryptid, scary stories of things that go bump in the night. My biggest problem with it is that it's very poorly defined. Like sure, the locals had their legends of it, but their legends weren't exactly coherent. Like in some stories, it's a ghost that your hand passes through, and in others, some old guy beat it to death and put it in his local pub. So while it's got potential, I don't think it's as cool because it's kind of more nebulous than things like the devil monkey we're going to talk about in just a minute. So while that holds it back a bit for me, the idea of a creature that attacks those who are alone on the road at night and can steal your horse and all that is still pretty fun, so I'm calling it a C tier. All right, well, this next one's just, uh, good luck. The Skeljask Rimsley? Skeljask Rimsley, sure. The shores of Iceland hold the legend of a terrifying beast. Stories of this creature date back to the 18th century, with fishermen along the frigid Icelandic waters describing encounters with a bear the size of a hippo covered with blue armored scales. The name itself translating to shell monster. Its blood is said to be toxic and its mouth fluorescent. They are said to live in the ocean, using their long claws to anchor into the seafloor and wait for prey, occasionally crawling to dark shores 
or bright homes after a storm. This horde legend kept a many a sailor at port, and some believe a ghastly presence may exist on the ocean floor around Iceland. This creature is absolutely terrifying. Imagine being a sailor in like the 17, 1800s, your ship is lit by candles and lanterns, and then out of the darkness, a hippo-sized armored bear <laughs> climbs up on your boat and just starts slaughtering people. And a lot of the details of the creature are very fantastical. Like there's stories of men shooting them after they come into their barn, but the blood gets all over the farmer and then he dies of a horrific illness that night. There's stories of sailors seeing what appears to be a glowing light out in the middle of the water, but then when they go to investigate, it's just this thing's mouth open just beneath the surface. It's horrifying, and it's very scary in a way that I wish a lot more cryptid stories were. Some of the best cryptid stories to me are the ones that make you afraid to go in the woods at night or make you remember to lock your door. And this one definitely hits those beats for me. It loses some points because there's not like a lot of core narratives or a lot of, you know, direct description of where it comes from or uh, what, what its purpose is. It's kind of just a creepy animal, but sometimes being a creepy animal is good enough. So I'm calling it B tier. Another one that I want to mention that goes in the non-applicable category is the Macos mammal. And I wanted to mention it because it's one of the most famous false cryptids reported. Basically in the mid 90s, someone was at a store in Ecuador and they found a taxidermized animal that was believed to be an unidentified species. So for a while, this thing made the rounds online and in cryptozoology communities of a possibly undiscovered creature in South America. However, the creature was eventually found and investigated and just found to be a manipulated taxidermy of a water possum. So I mentioned the macaque mammal because we're gonna see a lot of examples of carcasses or taxidermies that have been found in uh, different cryptozoology fields or different historic sightings. And this is just a reminder, along with others like the Minnesota Iceman, of things that were at one point believed to be encrypted, but have since been debunked. After that, we have the Makale Membe. In the Congo River Basin, legend exists of a creature near identical to modern depictions of the Brachiosaurus, albeit a bit smaller, roughly hippo to elephant size. The being is described as a sort of herbivore, yet violent to those who are unfortunate enough to cross paths with it while in the river. Rumors and documentation of this creature grew along with European colonies in the area in the early 1900s and even led to some controversy. Several expeditions were made into the region to prove the creature's existence as a means of disproving the theory of evolution. Needless to say, nothing conclusive was found, but legends of a dinosaur within Africa's interior persist to this day. There are several cryptids that are effectively arguing that a dinosaur didn't go extinct, and some of them still exist to this day. And the Makale Membe is probably the best example, because I believe it was like German colonies in the region around like the 1920s uh, began to hear stories of them, so they reported it to the greater scientific community of Europe and the United States, and in the 40s and 50s, that caused a huge rush of researchers to go to the area, because there were a lot of like young earth creationists who believed if they could find a living dinosaur, it would disprove theories of evolution at the time and effectively be another point towards young Earth creationism. So it's interesting how it lends a lot to cryptids involving, you know, dinosaurs that didn't go extinct or more broadly species that didn't go extinct, but it also leads into like sort of Bible Belt American culture and how they reacted to it. And it's fascinating how it kind of finds itself at the nexus point of a lot of different cultures trying to get their own thing out of the legend all at once. So while the creature would typically be like a D tier for me, because it's just like Nessie with legs <laughs> running around in the river attacking people, I think it gets some bonus points because of the impact that it had. So I'm calling it C tier. Next up, we have the Yaren. In the mountains of China, a group of hairy men have been reported descending from the hilltops to steal food and women since 300 BC. Said to sound like a bird and have incredible strength, in several legends, the Yaren have no females to their race and therefore must kidnap human women to reproduce with 
hence the reputation of murderous barbarians. Biologically, many believe early legends of the Yaren to be remnants of a Homo sapien relative now lost. Culturally, the Yaren has found root in Chinese belief, with legends of Yaren kidnappings adopting a comedic tone, and some women even claiming to have had a child with one of these creatures. In the midst of deforestation in China around the 1970s, the Yaren became a symbol of the natural world and a part of a campaign to save the forest. By appearance, Yaren are pretty similar to just a species of Bigfoot, but it's the stories around them that make them so unique. A group of men that live in the mountains and will come steal your food and take away your women. And while a lot of the classic stories are more malicious in tone, a lot of the modern ones tend to be lighthearted. For example, there's one popular legend where the genders of the creatures and the humans are flipped, so it's a group of women hairy monster people up in the mountains who have to come steal men to father their children. And the tone of the stories is often comedic with the hairy women being described as being beautiful and the men willingly leaving their wives to be kidnapped <laughs> by the creatures. And like I said, in some cultural aspects, Yaren have become a symbol of nature, pretty similar to how in the northwest parts of the United States, Bigfoot can be seen as a friend of the trees or a uh, something that speaks for the trees. And is that the Lorax? I just quoted the Lorax. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Effectively, the Yaren has become a symbol of natural preservation as well. That being said, still kind of a Yeti slash Bigfoot ripoff, but it's a fun ripoff, so I'm calling it C tier. And then lastly, for tier three, we have the Devil Monkey. The woods of the United States host a particularly odd sighting. According to reports, four foot tall baboons with incredible speed and agility stalk the American woods with extreme aggression. Early accounts place the creature in the Southeast United States across areas like Tennessee and Virginia, but sightings continue into the American West and even Canada. Attacks are common and Whereas many cryptids seem to avoid humanity, the devil monkey appears to be exclusively violent towards us. Reports of unidentified feral attackers and things like the Derrider roadkill images posted online in 1996 support the notion of some unknown beast in the North American tree line. Now, if you're from somewhere in the Southeast, you have probably heard a story or know someone that's heard a story about a wild monkey or wild baboon out in the hills. It's a joke a lot of old timers would tell. People would go out deer hunting and they'd warn them to watch out for that crazed monkey out there. But of course, with any legend, it lends to the notion if all these different people are talking about the same creature, then maybe there's something to the myth. And things like the dare to roadkill I mentioned, the idea that in Louisiana, there was just this thing found dead on the side of the road, what else might have died off in the woods? What rare species might still be out there attacking people that we're just not aware of yet? Devil Monkey kind of works its way into jackalope territory in a lot of stories and that the details are purposefully fantastical or over the top for the sake of a joke. And while yeah, a monkey or basically a baboon attacking people isn't that insane outside of the region it's taking place in, it's still fun how it can make its way into a lot of local legends. So I'll call it C tier. And with that, we are done with tier three of the iceberg and begin our voyage into this behemoth I have made for myself. I realize looking at this, I'm gonna have to change a lot to make all of this fit on these two whiteboards, but that's problems for future Windigoon. Current Windigoon's just not gonna worry about it. So I'll go ahead and wrap this up so I can get to editing and get it out to you all as quickly as possible. But I just wanna say thank you for watching. This series is something that's been in the back of my head for a while, so then I start with the initial iceberg, but then I just thought, you know, why make anything easy for myself? And why not make it some super series that we can take our time on? And there's no reason to rush it through December when I think it can be more if I just let it take whatever time it naturally has. I don't know if 350 terms is natural, but it's too late now. But for real, I wanna say thank you so much to everyone for the support you've shown the series. I know that it's shorter than a lot of my normal uploads and I know it's more broken up and I think a lot of you guys prefer having long stuff all at once, but the fact that you're willing to watch these parts as they come out and be so supportive and engaging with them, it really does mean the world. And thank you to 
the kind comments I've seen from people, the kind comments I've received from other creators I look up to, it, it really is special. And thank you. I, I, I do, even if I don't reply to all your comments or I don't engage a lot just because I'm busy with other stuff, I do see them and I do appreciate them. So thank you all for the support you've shown the series. It really does mean the world. So I'm going to get uh, started with editing this. And then the other parts, I will say the next video that's going to come out after um, this one isn't going to be another part of the Cryptid Iceberg. Because if I just did like the whole Cryptid Iceberg is every upload, then the next like three months on the channel would just be Cryptid Iceberg. And that's lame. So I've got a cult related video hopefully going up soon. Um, so hopefully you guys enjoy that. But yeah, I'm going to break this up. Maybe every two or three videos will be another Cryptid Iceberg. Because now that I've made the iceberg, it's easier to wrap my head around and do research. Um, but yeah, it's not going to be all in a row. It'll be broken up. Similar to how the Conspiracy Theory ice Iceberg series was done, for those of you that remember that. Or the Serial Killer Iceberg, or what have you. Um, so yeah, another Iceberg series. Hopefully you all enjoy it. And thank you so much to those who have said kind words or constructive criticism about it thus far. It means a lot. Uh, I do want to add that the podcasts are going great. Thank you all so much for the attention you've shown that. The Red Thread got to number two overall on Spotify, at least in the U.S. Uh, number two right behind Joe Rogan for like a couple days, and that's insane. And then Creepcast, the first episode of that, which the third episode just came out. There's not that many episodes. The first episode already has over a million views, with the second one close to it and the third one's doing great just... You guys have been incredible. The support means the world. Again, for those that don't know, I've got a podcast with Moist Critical and uh, Jackson Clark called The Red Thread. Link to that's in the description. And I have another podcast with Meat Canyon. Uh, link to that's in the description as well. But both have been great, and it really does just mean the world that I can try new things. I can step out and do something creatively that I want to test out. And you guys show up in droves. And similar to this series, it means the world. Thank you. So I'll quit yapping, uh, even though <laughs> it's got me this far. <laughs> uh, I'll shut up and get to work on this so you all can see it. But again, thank you guys so much for everything. I really appreciate it. And I believe that should do it for now. Look out for new podcast episodes linked in the description, new episodes of this series, and new regular videos, as well as stuff going on on the second channel. Be in tune for all of that as we go into 2024, and I hope all of you have a very happy new year. But I believe all of that should do it for now. But I just want to say, thank you for watching, I hope that you enjoyed, and I will see you in the next one.